I looked at the woman who had helped my wife slide off her buddy. What the hell is wrong with you, D? I thought you were our friend. We talked about what it would mean if a spouse cheated. We were all in agreement. And now this? Oh, he's famous. So it's okay. You'll get over it quickly. I always thought you were a bit stupid, but I underestimated your idiocy. By a wide margin. I want you to do one thing for me. Don't ever talk to me again. Ever again. You wouldn't like it if you did. If I'm in the water and I go down for the third time and you walk by, keep going. I'd rather die. Now get away from me. It was easy to see that she was out of it. I had never come close to talking to someone in our circle like that. I turned and started to walk towards the door when I was intercepted by a huge bouncer. Is the night over already? Get out of my way. He smirked. Oh, drunk and belligerent. I think for everyone's sake you should just turn around and go back to your table. Have some drinks, I'll make sure they're on the house. I glared at him until he started to get a little nervous. How much is he paying you to intervene? Hopefully a lot, because if you don't get out of my way right this damn minute, you're going to need every penny. His eyes widened and he pouted slightly. You can't have me. I'll wipe the floor on your sorry ass and not break a sweat. More than likely, but you should know something. I don't fight fair and I don't forgive. If you do beat me up, be sure to finish me off, because when I recover, I'm coming after you. You'll have to think twice before you go out in the dark for the rest of your life. Maybe I'll just hire a couple guys and be a thousand miles away when it happens. Maybe I'll pay them a little extra to make sure your career as a club security guard is over. If I can't get to you, then you married? Parents? You'll be sick every time you look at them when I'm done. So you have a choice. Move. He didn't notice as he stepped back. Funny, really, that he was at least 655 tall and weighed about 300. I had 5'11 and 180 in me, and I was willing to bet he had a much better fat-to-muscle ratio than I did. I had something he didn't. Pure, unadulterated nuclear rage. It couldn't be beaten. I was almost to the door when someone grabbed my arm. I clutched at the hand and spun around, dragging the person holding me away. When I realized it was Janie, I let her go. I was about to walk away when she grabbed my leg. Don't do this. Think about your kids. I looked at her with all the contempt I was capable of. You mean like she did when she slipped out the back door with that asshole? As for family, I don't have any anymore. I'll always be good to my kids, unlike that bitch who used to be my wife. Maybe I'll file for custody in the divorce. After all, her actions today prove she's an unfit mother. She let go of him and covered her mouth with her hand. I made it to the elevator before another volley rang out. Bob, think about this. Are you really going to throw away 10 years because of one night? I looked at my former friend and his gang. I didn't throw away a damn thing. She did. Look me in the eye and tell me you think what she did was acceptable. Every one of you assholes, look at me. I want each and every one of you to tell me that you don't think what she did was so bad and that if your wife had done that, everything would have been fine. Oops, sorry, Harry. That ship has already sailed. You know she's seeing him again, don't you? Harry threw a glance at Erica, and she hung her head and walked back to the clubhouse. The others were yelling, mostly at each other, and I took the opportunity to slip into the elevator. It didn't take me long to pack. I left Linda's shit where it was. If she wanted it, she could come and get it. I was discharged 30 minutes later and had already reached the parking lot when I heard them. Apparently, my friends were waiting for me. They started arguing, and Eric stood in front of my car door. You have until I turn this thing on to get out of the way. Anyone who doesn't will be sprawled across the parking lot. Move it. Now. You'll listen to us. That was all he had time to say before I put my fist into his gut. None of them were fighters, and none of them had learned how to defend themselves. But I had, because when I was a teenager I had a temper and got into fights a lot. I got in trouble with the law a couple of times because of that, and when it came to counseling or juvie, I went to a few sessions. It really helped me with my anger control issues. I still lost my temper but rarely lost control. And right now I didn't care. I walked over and unlocked my door, looking back at them. I shifted into gear and stepped on the gas, ripping forward with a screech of tires. They scattered like quail. I had no idea where I was going or what I was going to do when I got there. She'd been gone for almost an hour by then, so she was probably already having fun with him. 
My first inclination was to find them and leave them both in a pool of blood. But I doubted that would happen for a number of reasons. The guy was the number one tight end for the local pro football team, and they pinned their hopes of bringing home a winning season this year, maybe taking them to the championship, on his ability. He had just signed a three-year contract worth $106 million, on top of the millions he had already made. His house will probably be locked up tighter than Fort Knox. Besides, I wasn't a martial arts expert or a former Navy SEAL. I was just a guy. A guy in decent shape, but still just a guy. I had no access to unlimited wealth, no friends in high or low circles. I was sitting at a stoplight, and then it hit me. There was something I could do, and now was the time to start doing it. I realized that if I went forward, there would be no turning back. I stopped in front of a late-night diner that advertised free Wi-Fi. Before I started, I thought about my plan. If I wanted revenge, social media was the way to go. Linda had every imaginable account. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even something called TikTok. I wasn't an IT nerd. I could barely get online, but I knew someone who could. My niece. She had just turned 18 and had four scholarship offers. Two from Ivy League schools and two from technical colleges on both coasts. I called her and she was very surprised to hear from me so late. But when I told her I would give her $500 if she would come and help me, she was very interested. I was about to tell her where I was when I heard the ping. Got it, Unc. We'll be there in seven minutes. I wondered who we was, but as long as she was walking, I didn't care. While I waited, I went inside and asked the waitress for a quiet booth as far away from people as possible. Then I surprised her. You close at midnight, don't you? She nodded. Tell me how many customers you'll have from the time you close and how much to tip. While you're thinking, let me tell you that two of my friends are coming over soon, and I'd like the place to be as crowded as possible. Tell the owner I'll make up for lost profits if he'll let us sit here and work for an hour or two. And another 200 for you if you keep bringing in sodas and coffee. She grinned. It's the end of February and it's damn cold outside. Everyone who plugged in is hanging out somewhere or staying home? I'll close right now. I can get away with it since I own the place. Give me 400, three for me, and one for my cook. Do you need anything before I send him home? Just at this time, my niece came in, and a lad was with her. I almost didn't recognize her. She seemed to have really cleaned up her act. I immediately apologized. I'm sorry, guys. If I had known you had plans, I never would have asked you to come. I'm sure you'll think my wishes are crazy, but hear me out. First, let me tell you what happened. When I had finished, they looked at me with their jaws dropped. Nanette hissed indignantly. Let me tell you. Your wife, my aunt, left you alone in a club to spend the night with some superstar jock, and your friends covered for her while she pulled away? What kind of assholes do you hang out with? Those are uncharted waters for me. They're actually her friends, the bunch she ran around with in high school and college. She was beyond thrilled when my company wanted to move me to this place. As we drove away, she would show Chicago in her rearview mirror. I had been around them for a long time and thought we had the same outlook on life. I can assure you that we are no longer friends. Let me tell you what I want, and you tell me what a terribly bad idea it is and how much trouble I'll get in if I do it. I told them what I wanted, and Eric and Nanette looked at each other and then burst into laughter. When they came to their senses, Nanette asked Eric to get the black box out of the car. The black box turned out to be an unregistered laptop that she had slightly modified. No one will be able to trace it. I'll call stations all over the world and I won't be on hold for longer than half a second at anyone. It's something I've been working on since I was 13 and kept secret until I was of age and could get a patent on it. That explains a lot of why all these schools are out to get me, and the military offered me a very lucrative offer to skip college and go straight to work for them. Nanette asked all sorts of questions as she set everything up. I got it, she exclaimed, showing me my wife's Facebook screen. I'm in. Let the chaos begin. They scrolled through her posts, stopping to ask who the different people were while Nanette made notes on her phone. When a picture of her best friend and a strange coordinator popped up on the screen, I almost lost my senses. Then a thought occurred to me, and I gave her the names of my so-called friends who were with us. She had all the accounts up in a matter of minutes. Nanette grinned, looking at Dee. She has something to show me. Are you ready? Make it as disgusting as possible. Eric was quiet for a moment. Are you sure about this? 
Once we start, there's no turning back. You're throwing a grenade into your marriage. I'm sure. Ever since this started, I don't think about anything else. There's no way in hell I could live with her again. She threw a grenade. In response, I'm going to DEFCON 4 and considering nuclear options. Get started. Nanette began typing, pretending to be my wife. Exciting update. I am proud to announce that I have officially joined the CCC, the Celebrity Club. It's her invention. Sounds luscious yet cool. I'm with Mark. I'm happy to say that he has a really tight end and can really ram it in when he finds a hole to slip into. I'm so proud that he picked me out of all the women in the club. Thanks to my girlfriend for stepping in to talk to my husband while I was slipping away. I'd say I owe you a debt of gratitude, but I've done the same for her before. Remember the girls' weekend in Atlantic City, D? You scored on a hockey player, and according to you, he actually knows how to score pucks. Ha ha! After that, Nanette displayed a bunch of smiley faces. Then she started again. Right now we're resting, so to speak, at halftime. We'll start the second half soon. Hopefully it will go into overtime. She then forged messages from all the women who were at the club, giving her literal high fives and telling her they couldn't wait for their time with the stud. Janie chastised her husband for being a patsy on the needles. He doesn't have to be rich, he just has to be strung out and last more than five minutes. She found some pictures of the asshole and posted them, as well as some pictures of Linda. It was almost midnight by then, but the notifications were lighting up as people were looking at the posts. I'm sure there were phones ringing in her social circle despite the late hour. Nanette then lit up Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. I wasn't worried about her getting calls because I was sure she had her phone turned off and I couldn't interfere with her plans. The comments started pouring in. Is this a joke? I bet your husband doesn't think it's funny. What the hell is going on with you? This was her favorite aunt speaking. I wondered in bewilderment why she was still awake. Nanette replied. This is no joke. I saw an opportunity and took it. How many can boast of having slept with someone famous? If you don't believe me, come to his house tomorrow around 10 o'clock. 130 Wyndham Circle. It's a bloody mansion. The rich really are different. Maybe we'll be up by then and you can see my walk of shame as I walk out of his house. Or maybe it's a walk of fame. Another person has joined this thread. I didn't know her, but it didn't matter. She had over 700 friends, and all of them were on the rumor mill. Really? You're proud of leaving your husband? Do you really think your marriage will survive this? I love my husband. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. And he loves me, so I know he'll get through this. There might be a little hardship, but I'll do my best to spoil him and he'll forgive me in the end. It doesn't mean anything. It's just one night and I'll never repeat it. Really? Are you drunk? As for never doing it again, did you ever think you'd do it the first time? You're delusional. I'm giving up on you as a friend. Don't try to contact me. I hope in the light of day you still think it was worth it. It may be all you have left to hang on to. I finally recognized the name. It was her boss's wife. That gave me another idea, and Nanette posted the whole thing on the company page. I bet she'll have some interesting conversations on Monday. Another person replied. It's all just nonsense, isn't it? If you think it's funny, you're wrong. Every word of it is true. We're going to be fine. I have faith in my husband. How did he believe in you? I think the only explanation is that you were hit by a Martian whore ray. I've seen some stupid decisions before, but this tops them all. It's almost Darwin Award level, but it usually ends in death. But maybe the death of your marriage will vindicate you. I'm with Rosalind. I'm leaving you. Don't try to reply because you will be blocked. God help you. This was from her first cousin. She lived in another state, and I wondered how long it would be before the extended family knew the details. Nanette looked sad. She had always liked Linda. You're destroying her, ripping the foundations of her life out from under her feet. Are you sure you don't want to stop? Not yet. I've got a few more things to do and then I'm done with her. Literally. We sent messages to the team's website, the NFL office, the offices of its charities, the mayor, the city council, all their official websites, and everyone we could think of. Nanette flooded Instagram and Twitter. The posts and comments poured in as fast as they could. Then she found his accounts and did the same. He was considered the paragon of an athlete involved in the community. 
He had two charities and was constantly involved in some form of volunteer work or another. The team and the league loved him. It was time to bring some pain. Eric made inquiries and got the name and number of a sports writer who, for some unknown reason, hated the guy. He was a little pissed about being dragged out of bed, but calmed down when I told him what I had. Eric put a voice scrambler on his phone and I sounded like a woman. Stop whining. I'm giving you an opportunity. Mark is with a married woman right now. He knew she was married because she was with her husband when he pulled her out of the shadow lounge tonight. It didn't seem to be the first time he'd done this. Talk to the bouncer if you don't believe me. Her name is Linda Hamilton. She's been married for 10 years and has two small children. So much for the NFL poster boy, huh? We later learned that he was furious because the man had pulled the same stunt on him. He and his wife had been separated for almost a year before reconciling, and she was still on shaky ground. Also, it was the off-season. There wasn't much going on in local sports, and that probably made the story more appealing. To be fair, we sent letters to local TV stations and newspapers. I doubted anything would come of it, but Mark was well-known and very popular, and the sharks had to smell blood on the water. By six in the morning, there were two vans and one regular reporter and the paparazzi at the gates of his upscale neighborhood. By eight, someone from the team or central office was beating on his door. He opened it in his robe and cameras zoomed in from the vantage points the videographers had found. Luck wasn't on their side because behind his back, Linda, also in a robe, was clearly visible. The cameras clicking frantically could be clearly heard. His eyes widened when he saw the reporters and the man stepped inside and slammed the door shut. The man must have told him the whole story, and Linda immediately opened her Facebook page. That house was a mansion of good brick and timbers, but the scream could be heard even outside the gate. It was the scream of a mortally wounded animal. She furiously tried to close her account, but found it had been locked. Nanette later counted them, and it turned out that in the first six hours alone, there had been over 3,000 comments on all media platforms. Linda had never been so popular. At 10 o'clock, they finally left the house. Linda had her head covered, but everyone knew who she was. I could hardly believe the coverage, but then again, he was a popular figure and it was a weekend, so the news was slow. She got into the unknown man's car and he drove around the house, coming out of the driveway. This wasn't their first rodeo and the paparazzi had spotted that entrance as well. They even managed to get a clear shot of Linda as she drove by. The man drove her home and I wondered what she thought when she was alone. I picked up the kids from the babysitter and drove them to my parents' house. I wasn't surprised to see her parents there because we were all very close. Both mothers were Facebook friends, so they saw everything. But again, she wasn't alone. Four cars were stalking her house and now they had her address. She got out of the car and ran to the front door as the questions rained down on her. Was she his girlfriend now? Had she left her husband for him? Did your husband approve of this? It was a particularly stupid question, but it was asked frequently over the next few weeks. When I talked to her family, it was a little stressful. We know what she did. Everyone in the southern half of the country knows. We also know it wasn't her on Facebook. Judging by her actions, she's not that smart, but she was never suicidal. How could you do that to her? Ask her the same question and get back to me. I had no intention of keeping the kids from her, but I wanted a few days to pass so things could settle down. I stopped where Linda was unlikely to look for me, in the room we'd rented for our romantic affair. The receptionist looked at me strangely when he checked the records, but gave me a room for three days. It was pretty funny to run into my former friends checking out of the hotel as I headed to my room to spend the night. I was on adrenaline and rage and had been awake for 30 hours by then. Dee rushed over to me. You bastard. Do you realize how much you hurt Linda? It was all for nothing, just a fantasy she wanted to fulfill. She would have been the same when she got home. No. She was damaged, and when I have something damaged, I have two choices. I have to decide if it's worth fixing, and if I think the cost is too high or get rid of it. Linda has damaged our marriage beyond resurrection, and it's not worth the emotional cost to repair it. I never slept with that hockey player. So you admit you dated him? From what I understand, you had dinner with him and then went to the dance. Even if you didn't sleep with him, it was a chance to fulfill a fantasy, wasn't it? Hubby will be upset if you tell him, but you can get him to forgive you, can't you? The rest of her group backed away, but at the mention of the hockey player, her husband burst forward. I'm going to kick your... 
As I told the bouncer, I don't fight fair. I fight to win. I hit him right at the junction with his femur, and while he squirmed in pain, I looked down and then at the cameras in the hall. It's all on tape, dude. Your attempt to attack me and my attempt to defend myself. Remember that as a life lesson and focus on what you're going to do with your bitch. I looked around at my former friends. I want you to remember this for the rest of your lives. I'll probably be divorced soon, but I'll bet good money I'm not the only one. You need to think about it and make some kind of decision. I'd wish you luck, but honestly, I hope your lives blow up as much as you helped blow up mine. Despite requests and then demands, I never slept in my old house again. Linda was very angry at first, not understanding why I was reacting this way. It just wasn't that big of a deal. Yes, she may have dumped me in the worst possible way and then spent the night having fun with a complete stranger, but that was all in the past and it was time to move on. He was famous for heaven's sake. It was all over now, so why not get back to normal? Truth be told, she had a thing for the asshole from back in the days when we lived in Chicago and he played there. I used to watch the Bears sometimes, and Linda would watch with me. When the charity poster came out with him on the cover, wearing long knit shorts and nothing else, she bought one. It must have been a dream come true when he asked her to dance. When she realized I wasn't going to just trot home like a good boy, she got bitchy. When she was served with a divorce citing adultery as the reason, she became furious. Linda resorted to every threat she could think of, but I persisted. Linda threw herself on my mercy and was surprised that I didn't have any. She barely held on to her job. It was a very close call, and it took quite a while before her boss told her no more than necessary, and even longer before his wife even acknowledged her presence in the room. We were ordinary people, and it would have stayed that way if it hadn't been for the man she was having fun with. The paparazzi got to the bouncer and waved green under his nose until he sang like a canary. There were at least three other incidents at that club alone. Mark liked to party. A lot. I bet he soon regretted not signing with another team when he left Chicago. The Panthers were a Carolina team, and North Carolina is an attachment alienation state. He should have chosen a home outside the state line. My lawyer advised me not to pursue him until the divorce was finalized, but he, his team, and the NFL went into full defense mode. One evening, I opened the door of my new apartment and saw a man with a briefcase in his hands. Sir, I'd like to talk to... Go away. I slammed the door shut and slid the deadbolt back into place. He pounded on the door so hard that I called the police, and they politely asked him to leave. He looked at the security camera I had installed and shook his fist before leaving. I then got a call from the new owner of the team. He introduced himself, and before he could continue, I stopped him. Four people in the world have my number. How did you get it? He sighed. Does it really matter? Yeah. I hung up, went straight to the phone store, and demanded a new number. This went on for eight days before I got another call. Sir, I represent the children's charity Go Deep. May I have a moment of your time? I'm sorry, but I already support three charities and don't have the funds to get involved in another one. You're having a good day. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not asking you for a donation. In fact, it's just the opposite. I'm willing to offer you a good amount of money. Why do you want to give me money? Sir, the founder and main donor is Mark Le... I hung up again and blocked his number. They recognized my new email address and sent me long emails about how my actions had hurt the charity and how donations had dropped so much. I couldn't help but respond and called them. So it's my fault that the charity is suffering? How exactly? Your accusations against Mark have tarnished his reputation and are causing him unnecessary suffering. If you would publicly state that you forgive him and your wife for a momentary oversight and allow him to redeem himself, public interest in this case would diminish. Let me be clear about this. This man seduced my wife. In front of me and about 50 witnesses, and the low-level thug he was paying tried to stop me when I tried to go after them. She stayed the night, and while she won't admit to having sex with him, we all know that's what happened. Tell you what, have him make a public statement that he had sex with my wife, even though he knew she was married, and I'll think about it. That wouldn't be in anyone's best interest. Can't we persuade you to leave sleeping dogs lying around? That old hound doesn't sleep. He's growling and foaming at the mouth, just wanting to rip a piece out of someone's ass. I'll tell you what. 
Let him donate all his money to a scientist to create a form of time travel, get back to my wife, and then we'll talk. In the meantime, if he thinks things are bad now, wait a few days. And don't ever contact me again. What are you... I spoke to Eric and Nanette, complaining about my inability to slam down my cell phone. That had given them an idea, and they had come up with an app that allowed them to do just that. It was an old-fashioned phone sound that you could use when you wanted to hang up. I bet a lot of telemarketers got an unpleasant surprise over the next few months. They patented it, or trademarked it, or whatever it was to keep other people from making money off of it. They charged a dollar per download and put me on the paperwork, saying that although it was their expertise, it was my idea. 33 cents wasn't much when you multiply it 50,000 times in just the first two months. Then it turned into serious money. I used it to buy a real house instead of the apartment I was living in, and the kids were happy about it. It broke my heart to leave them, but every time I looked at her I wished I hadn't killed her on the spot. The poor woman was deluded, seriously deluded. She thought I would just accept what she did and move on with my life. Her favorite refrain was, it was one night. Yes, it was one night. One night is one night too many. Tell me the truth. You knew I'd never let it happen if I found out early enough which is why you got your slut girlfriends to step in so you could slip away with your man whore like a thief in the night. Because that's exactly what you were. A thief. You stole our future that night, Linda. And you have no one to blame but yourself and your asshole. You think he's in pain? Hell no, he's not in pain. He's probably laughing about it as we speak. He doesn't care that he ruined a family. She ought. I almost never raised my voice in anger, and I certainly never said it to the kids or in front of them. Looking back, I don't think I ever did it toward her either. Perhaps that was the problem. She thought I was weak and was afraid I would leave her. The kids didn't take to it very well. Eventually, I sent them to therapy and it started to help. The therapist was careful not to belittle their mother. But she told them that their mother had made a very bad error in judgment and was now reaping the consequences. She invited us to attend a couple of sessions separately, and since I was paying, I got a summary of the sessions. She still denies her guilt and tells the children that although she did something, it wasn't bad enough to divorce her because of it. Your little girl asked her what she did, and she told her that it was an adult matter, and she would realize it in a few years. Your son is only four years old, but he memorizes what he sees and hears in the media. She never answered his questions directly, just told him she made a terrible mistake, and is trying her best to fix it. I don't think he believed that and has a lot of animosity towards his mother. I was asked the same questions in session, and I answered them as honestly as I could. Yes, son, I am divorcing your mother because of what you have heard. She broke a promise and a commitment by acting this way. You know that when you promise something, you have to fulfill it. When you become an adult, things get a little deeper. She made these promises in front of 200 people, legally and spiritually binding, and she knew full well what would happen if she broke them. But she did it anyway. I still love your mother, but I don't trust her anymore, and trust is the key issue. Let's say I promised to pick you up from school on Wednesdays, and I did for a year. Then I missed one and left you where you were. I knew I should have picked you up, but decided I was more interested in doing something else. How many times are you going to stand there waiting for me before you realize you can't trust me to pick you up? Would you believe me if I told you it wouldn't happen again? I think I managed to get through to them a little bit and follow the therapist's instructions exactly. I didn't say anything bad about their mother. I told them that although our relationship had changed, we both loved them very much. Other than that, I didn't talk about their mother unless they brought it up themselves. Linda did the exact opposite. She told the kids that yes, she made a bad mistake, but it wasn't bad enough to end the marriage. She told them that I was just being stubborn and things would work out. The therapist was beyond angry and in a meeting with her said, How could you do this to your children? Your husband shows no inclination to reconcile. Moreover, in one of our sessions he talked to the children about divorce. They had enough classmates in the same situation to get a basic understanding of how things work. They had also watched enough of their parents' remarriages to realize that sometime in the future, there might be someone new in their lives. Your children believe, and I might add quite rightly, that your relationship with your husband is over. I know you've had several conversations, but it hasn't helped, and I think I understand why. You still refuse to consider that you have done anything wrong, at least so wrong as to divorce because of it. I highly recommend that you seek counseling with a married couple. I don't believe it will help you reconcile, 
but perhaps it will lead to you being able to accept the way things are and move on. I will not be seeing you again. Thank you for attending the ones I asked for. That didn't make any impression on Linda other than the remark about counseling. Her counselor was pretty good and the judge ordered eight sessions. If after four sessions the therapist felt there was no further progress, she could stop all further sessions. On the other hand, if she saw progress, she could add more sessions. My lawyer tried to gag me, but I stood up and asked the judge if I could speak. He nodded, warning me to be polite. Your Honor, I need to be clear. I have no interest in a further relationship with my wife other than as co-parents of our children. With that in mind, I will attend the sessions. But I absolutely refuse to attend more than eight sessions. That should be enough to resolve all of our concerns. I'm serious, Your Honor. Yes, you can put me in jail or fine me or both if I refuse, but you have to think about this. This divorce is getting a lot of media attention, and I'm sure you don't want it to turn into a quagmire of mud, and I, for one, am more than happy to talk to the press. One more thing, Your Honor. I want her lover to attend one meeting and explain why he thinks sleeping with married women is a good idea, and why he thinks it shouldn't affect my marriage. Thank you, sir. My lawyer looked at me like I had grown two heads, and the judge looked like he didn't know whether to laugh or throw me under the bus. Linda looked like she was going to get physically sick any second, and her lawyer seemed to be trying to find something to object to. Finally, he banged the gavel twice. I don't have the authority to send him to marriage counseling if it's not his marriage. I'll draft a letter requesting consideration, but I wouldn't hold out much hope for that. Your attorney may tell you that it is perfectly legal to require him to appear in court, but that is entirely up to you. Counselors, submit a list of therapists or get one from the court, but I want all parties to agree and sessions to start in two weeks. I will also require sessions to be twice a week. That way it will be over much sooner rather than later. If any of your clients miss a session, I will not threaten them with jail. I'll just declare the session valid and they can't reschedule. Ordered. Bailiff, proceed to the next case. Linda was not pleased. Not at all. She was waiting for me at the car with a determined look on her face. This has to stop. Please. This is not at all what I wanted. I thought it was a bad idea to talk to her without our lawyers present, but curiosity took over. Just for the sake of conversation, what did you think was going to happen? I thought you'd be angry, but love me enough to put up with it. It was one night. All the years we've been together, our family, our kids, it wasn't worth throwing away for one night. It wasn't just one night. It was every night for the rest of our lives after that night. What you did was cold, calculating, and the ultimate in disrespect. You left me fooled in front of our supposed friends, and some of them even helped you slip out the back door like a whore. Before tonight, I would have bet my life that you loved me and our children, Linda. Not anymore. We're broken up, and all the counseling in the world won't fix that. I'll see you at the first session. Wait. I need a favor. What favor can you ask me? It's about Mark. Could you cut him some slack? It's starting to affect his charity work. Think of the children. You mean like you and him thinking about ours the other night? I don't care about his charities, and I promise you that pretty soon his charity will be the least of his problems. Will you tell me how you know that? She had enough guilt to lower her eyes. He called me. He did? How did he get your number? Her face reddened, and then it hit me. You gave it to him that night, didn't you? In case he wanted to repeat the performance? He didn't. I don't know why I gave it to him, I just did. I should have known you wouldn't help. I just laughed and got in the car, marveling at how stupid she had become. While all of this was going on, I was being pressured to be reasonable. The league, the team, every organization associated with football, its charities, several sports talk shows, Everyone was pressuring me to leave it alone. Even my boss, a big fan of the team, put a little pressure on me. In response, I found another job. I think he realized too late how I would react and how it would look to everyone else in our organization and the public. He tried to back down and keep me on the team, but it was too late. I wondered how angry he was about the complaint I had filed with corporate HR. I had a feeling his future was toast, and I figured it wouldn't happen to a more deserving person. It got so bad that I started writing down every conversation I had. The first few I didn't, but then I did, and that led to some pretty short conversations. The sportscaster we called the night the whole mess started invited me on his radio show. 
It was his show, ranked number one in listenership, and I threw in a few bombshells, snippets of conversations I'd had with various people. One that was a big hit was a line about a team owner. He called, got outraged, and threatened to sue me. The sports announcer did nothing but hold back from laughing. You can't see him, but my guest is nodding his head affirmatively. He doesn't even seem to be impatient. Is there anything you'd like to say? He nodded as the microphone turned on, and the first thing I did was laugh. What are you going to sue me for? For telling the truth? I checked, and in this state it's perfectly legal to record your conversations without notifying the person you're talking to. It's called one-party consent. Besides, I'm not going to use this conversation in any legal matter unless you insist on it. My attorney says we have good reason to accuse you, the team as a whole, and the National League of Harassment and Unwarranted Mental Anguish. Do you have anything else to say? He hung up. The program was picked up by several syndicated programs, and it briefly made the national news. I never heard another word from them. Mr. Mark found that the press ignored him unless someone wanted to ask about the divorce. He was used to being treated like a hero, to being the center of attention, and it frustrated him greatly. Even though his lawyers told him not to say anything and to be careful, he still snapped and did something stupid. He came after me at my house. The first thing I did was install a state-of-the-art security system when I bought my new house. Ironically, it was the system he had advertised in the company's commercials, and he was right. It was worth it. One night, there was a knock on the door, and when I looked at my phone, the doorbell camera showed three very large men standing on the porch of my house. They didn't look happy. I had my kids with me, so I pressed the silent alarm button, which automatically alerted the police. They called immediately. You'd be surprised how many people set it off by accident. Sir, this is 911. Did you send out the alarm? Yes. There are three very large men standing on my porch. Three men I don't know, three men who don't look happy. I didn't open the door, and now they're pounding on it, demanding that I let them in. Sir, we have a car four minutes away. If you fear for your safety, do not open the door. I thanked them and waited three and a half minutes before opening the door, making sure the storm door was locked. What can I do for you? Mark sent us to reason with you. You will immediately drop all legal action against him. And if I don't? Then we'll give you a lesson in cooperation. Gentlemen, you are trespassing. Please leave the premises immediately. The largest of them sighed. Well, boys, it looks like this man needs convincing. The storm door could have been made of styrofoam when he ripped it off its hinges. They were about to enter when a voice sounded behind them. Police. Stop immediately and turn around with your hands up. If looks could kill, they wouldn't have to touch me to get what Mark wanted. The big guy looked like he was about to join the fight, but his buddies talked him out of it. Pretty soon they were all on the ground with handcuffs on their hands. The sergeant took my report from me and, after reviewing the tapes, charged them all with trespassing. I later learned that trespassing carries a much harsher penalty. The difference was that trespassing is usually a spontaneous decision and there was usually no serious criminal intent. If, on the other hand, you come onto someone's property on purpose to cause them harm, that's a whole different category. It turned out that one worked at the stadium as a keeper, and the other was just a friend of the third. He was on the team's practice squad, but he was immediately expelled. Apparently, Mark had promised him a spot on the team if he did him this favor, even though he had no authority to do so. The rest of them were getting a grand a buck each. It cost Mark a lot more because he had to pay the lawyer's bills. I don't know how much it cost him, but they all pleaded guilty and got a huge fine that Mark had to pay. He had to go to court for setting it all up, and even his hero status couldn't save him. His lawyers managed to reduce the case to a misdemeanor. He had to pay a $5,000 fine and do 200 hours of community service. TMZ made a video of him in an orange vest picking up trash on the highway. It hit YouTube and gained 600,000 views in the first week. Linda was rapidly becoming the most expensive woman he'd ever gone after. Some fans turned against him, and although it wasn't visible on TV, signs appeared in the stands as the new season began. It was affecting his play, and one group put up a large banner. Put someone's wife on the goal line. It will make him focus. Of course, stadium security made them take the poster down, but it was too late. Within three hours, the video went viral and racked up three quarters of a million views in the first two days. Mark went from being a franchise player to getting little playing time, 
and one of his sponsors scrapped a campaign they'd started until things settled down, which meant never. The law of averages caught up with me one night. They came out of nowhere, four of them. They beat the shit out of me, and I ended up with two broken fingers on my hand, a broken leg, a cracked cheekbone, and bruised ribs. These guys knew what they were doing because it all happened in about 90 seconds. I don't know how much damage they would have had time to do if it hadn't been for a co-worker who came out of the office right after me. When he yelled, they demonstrated their professionalism by immediately running away. Ten minutes later I was in an ambulance, and an hour later I was in the room where they left me overnight for observation due to a concussion. My head was splitting and I was falling in and out of consciousness. One day I woke up and thought I saw Linda sitting there, but I immediately blacked out briefly. When I woke up again I was alone. It was seven days before I was able to return to work. The cops had gotten some surveillance images from several businesses across the street, but none of them had anything identifiable on them. The police officer who took my statement gave me some advice. If you've messed with anyone lately, tell me. These guys were professionals. They avoided cameras as much as possible, wore big hats and loose clothing, so we don't have faces or anything recognizable like tattoos or scars. I told him my sad story. I was told that he laughed when they questioned him and admitted that he didn't like me, but that he had nothing to do with the attack. They didn't believe it for a minute, but they had no proof. I had to give up my weekends with the kids. I wasn't physically fit and I didn't want them to see me until the bruises came off. Linda was horrified by what had happened, but agreed. She even offered to come over and help. I politely declined. The counseling session dragged on as it usually does. It was a wash, rinse, repeat cycle that went on for four sessions before even the therapist got bored with it. On the fifth session, she asked us not to interrupt her as she spoke. We've reached an impasse, and frankly, I don't think we'll ever get past it. Linda, you refuse to admit that what you did was wrong by conventional standards, and you refuse to think that should stop your marriage. Am I? You left your husband in the middle of a club, and then poof, you left to spend the night with another man. You did it completely unannounced and used your friends so he wouldn't stop you. Tell me, if he had done that to you, left you standing in the middle of a public place surrounded by your so-called friends who were complicit in the deception, would you have been sympathetic? Judging by your actions and communication here, I highly doubt it. Uh, hold on. Don't speak. Think about it while I talk to your husband. She turned to me with an expression of sadness on her face. You'll never get her back. That's as clear as the nose on your face. From the way you and I have been communicating, it goes without saying. I understand I really do, but let me ask you this. Up until the moment she left the club with another man, you loved her. She was faithful and steadfast all these years. Your wife says it was a one-time act that even she doesn't understand, but it was important enough to jeopardize her marriage. She swears it's out of her system and she will never do anything like it again. Is there anything left in you ready to try again? I'll let your wife speak first. Please don't interrupt. You will have your say afterward. Agreed? She nodded to Linda, and we waited a minute while she gathered her thoughts. You know, you've talked a lot about how I have little remorse for my actions. I have remorse, a lot of remorse. I never thought it would hurt our marriage until the divorce. I knew I had hurt you badly, and I knew you would be angry. But really, I never thought you would react the way you did. I am terribly sorry that my actions hurt you, and I can assure you in the strongest possible terms that I will never do anything like that again especially now that I know the price of such actions. I beg you, even if you don't forgive me completely, come home and let me make things right. She seemed satisfied with her speech and looked at me expectantly. You can say whatever you want, Linda, but on some level you knew how much what you did hurt us. You knew I wasn't some passive guy who would just brush it off and say, well, it's just one time and she says she won't do it again. Bullshit. If I did that, you'd lose all respect for me and maybe you wouldn't actively seek her out. But if another opportunity presented itself, you'd run away like a bastard, knowing I'd forgive. I don't do that now, and I will never allow myself to be in that situation again so that I have to forgive. Aside from the blatant disrespect you showed, the destruction of trust in my marriage topped it off. Even before I left, if you had been gone for more than 30 minutes, I would have wondered if you were having fun with him or someone else. Let me make this as clear as I can to you. We're not staying married. I'm divorcing you. You can drag this out, use every delaying tactic you can, but eventually the court will get tired of it all and it will happen. Please don't procrastinate any longer. 
I looked at the counselor. Are we done? She sighed. Yes. I will submit my report to the court no later than Wednesday, say the marriage is irreversibly broken, and recommend that they grant the divorce. No. I'm not giving up. Please, darling, think of the children. I am thinking about the children. I think about them every damn day I don't have them. Tell me, Linda, if the kids were so important to you, how many times did you think about them while he was shaking the crap out of you in his mansion? Was the trip worth it? For you, maybe. For the rest of your family, who had yet to live in the real world, not so much. Face it, Linda, you screwed up. Pun intended. See you in court. I think the consequences of what she did eventually got to her. Everyone was just tired at the end. Her lawyer was tired. My lawyer was tired. The judge was exhausted. One of the bailiffs looked like he had aged five years since the trial started. After the therapist's report, the judge cut short another attempt to stall and declared us divorced. Linda walked out of court without saying a word, and my lawyer only grinned when I asked the question. Now? He grinned a wild grin worthy of a rabid mountain lion. Yes. Now. The next day, Mr. Mark was sued for alienation of affection. He didn't have to sign with the Panthers or buy a house in North Carolina. I'm told his outcry was epic. He can't do it. His lawyer sighed. Unfortunately, he can. It's still on the books in North Carolina. Before you start, yes, it's an archaic law that should have been repealed years ago. Most states did. Unfortunately, this is not one of them. My advice is to settle the case as quickly as possible and put it behind you. The notoriety may cost you more than the settlement. Everyone in his orbit called. His lawyers called. The heads of his charities called. Team officials called. Even the NFL commissioner. All begging me for an out-of-court settlement. The offers kept mounting, and even my lawyer told me I should accept, but I refused. It didn't matter that I wouldn't get anything. What mattered was that I could sling it in the mud. The investigators my lawyer hired got the bouncer and the team leader to confess that they were paid to help them accomplish their goals. Mark tried to avoid appearing in court, but since he had to testify several times, he had no choice. One of the appearances was on a Friday, and he tried to excuse himself by saying he had to fly to another city that day to prepare for a rare Saturday game. The judge was not a football fan. Take a later flight and be in this courtroom tomorrow. I think he put us on the docket as late as possible just to annoy him. The man had charm, and his lawyers tried to recruit a jury of women, but my lawyer was smart enough to outsmart them a few times. They recruited seven women, but three of them were over 50 and happily married. One was a lesbian, two were young and single, and the last was a blonde who had just recently divorced. Two of the men were young and single, and the other three were married and middle-aged. First he said he had never seen her, and they had gone down the road of shame, so he had to admit that she had been in his house. Then he began to deny that they had sex, saying he was trying to protect her from her abusive husband. Linda decided that if she described her experience in a letter, I would better understand her thoughts, and since the letter was written to me and in my possession, we were able to present it in court. No one believed the ploy with the abusive husband. The final nail in the coffin lid was Linda's court appearance. She said everything, even how many times she'd slept with him. I had no idea. In the letter she indicated it was three or four, but it was actually five. The jury was out for less than an hour before returning with a verdict. Part of the trial was full financial disclosure, and I think everyone in the courtroom was amazed at how much he was worth. He played in the NFL for seven years and had amassed a fortune of $96 million. I thought my lawyer was going to faint when I was awarded about a third of that, $30 billion. It was the highest award in the state's history, but it was in line with what other spouses had received. The highest award previously was $8.8 .8 million. The laws were recently changed, but they still allowed up to one-third of the defendant's assets to be paid. Of course, when this was enacted, hardly anyone thought a case with that many millions would ever arise. There were a number of moves in the state legislature to repeal this law, but it didn't make it through committee. I was lucky. His lawyers pouted their lips and tried to appeal, secretly urging him to take the deal and be done with it. They filed a notice of intent to appeal, but dropped it a month later and agreed to the court's decision. Apparently, there was a loophole in the law. If the defendant's fortune grew during the appeal, and he still lost, the amount of the deal would be adjusted accordingly. A couple months later, he had a huge contract payment waiting for him. 
The day after I received the award, my attorney served him with four more lawsuits from married couples and divorced men and women who claimed. Of the four, two were divorced, one marriage was still on shaky ground, and another couple turned out to be swingers and thought he had chosen her. But as the offering train was about to leave the station, they jumped on board. The divorced wives, including Linda, filed separate lawsuits. I'd already gotten a big piece of the pie, and some of the seduction had happened years ago, and they settled out of court quickly, getting four million each. Still, the son of a bitch was left with tens of millions. The saga wasn't over yet. It turned out that he was having an affair with the wife of one of his teammates, and had a one-night stand with another. It was a little fact that the investigators found out, and I was happy to share it. During the next play, several players either fell or blocked in the wrong direction, and he took three hits, the last of which took him out of the game through concussion protocol. No excuses could have been made, but everyone realized his continued play with the Panthers was not a viable option. They traded him to Green Bay, where he played well but not spectacularly. His earnings took a big hit when the Panthers refused to pay out on his contract, citing a morals clause. He had to settle for 20% of what he could have earned. Green Bay gave him a one-year contract, and when it expired, refused to pay him what he wanted, so he went to Denver on another one-year, $4 million deal. He played at full strength, and after his contract ended, some teams were interested enough to offer him a contract but at a much lower salary. He eventually signed a two-year contract with Cincinnati at a salary of $2.5 million. It had strict morals clauses, including forfeiture of everything he had earned to date if he was caught in compromising conditions. While his play wasn't bad, it wasn't in keeping with his prime, and they wouldn't offer another contract when his current one expired. He was already 34 years old, battered and suffering from constant injuries, so he retired and had a radio show with the Bengals for two years. After that, he became a nobody. The bastard still had a fortune of about 50 million, which was about a third or less of what he might have had if not for lawsuits and bad publicity. When last heard of, he had bought two car dealerships in California and was up to his old tricks again. One of the spouses took it personally and Mark walks with a pronounced limp. I doubt he's learned anything. I saw a picture of him in a sports magazine, something like, Where Are They Now?, where he was pictured at the opening of the third dealership. He had a pretty good spare tire, and he shaved his head when he started going bald. Nevertheless, all those millions in his glory days would probably still attract the ladies. I thought about forwarding the article to Linda. Linda got half of everything we had saved and could keep the house until the last child turned 18. Then she could buy it or we would sell it and split the profits. She also received child support based on my former salary. They were still my children, so if they needed anything extra, they got it. I bought her a new SUV because her car was totaled and she hadn't gotten her payment yet. My kids needed reliable and safe transportation. I often wondered if the fact that I got all those millions just because she was a woman and she didn't have access to any of it was hindering her. Linda wasn't completely destitute. She eventually got a settlement from her lover, and since Nanette and Eric had come up with an app based on my idea when we were still married, she got half of my share. The app was very popular for years, especially when they added the option to let you talk when it was slammed. The most popular were go to hell, kiss my ass, and don't ever goddamn call me again. They cost five apiece. Her paycheck was about $30,000 a year for about three years, after which the method stopped being popular and the payouts got much smaller. I didn't need it, but I put my share into the kids' college fund, telling them when they got older that every time they heard that, their college fund got bigger. One day I calculated it as accurately as I could. As a result of the lawsuits, the loss of a lucrative contract and publicity, the reduction in payouts, and the shortening of Mark's career, he probably lost between 110 and 170 million, making Linda one of the most expensive whores in history. Everyone should be famous for something, I guess. Dee divorced less than a year after us. Janie and her husband lasted another 18 months before going their separate ways. The ones where the wife had already cheated divorced before my divorce was final. As far as I know, the rest stayed as couples. I didn't care. After that last morning, I never spoke to them again. Six years passed, and every once in a while I would wake up and reach for Linda, usually after I had a dream about what we were like before that incident. I didn't remarry, I was still a little shy around women, but I started dating. I was surprised at the number of women who wanted deeper relationships until I realized they had my money in mind. 
This made me extremely wary. Both kids are very into soccer now. My son does it mostly for friends and fun, but my daughter is very serious about it and has some good talent. Her best friend plays a little better than she does, and I got to know her and her mom because of all the sleepovers. Scarlett was wayward and not very confident due to her psycho ex doing her head in. I found out from her daughter that she was tight with money because her ex disappeared and stopped paying child support. Without saying a word to her, I located him and arrested him for failure to pay child support. He had a good job and the judge ordered him to pay off all arrears within two years or go to jail. This caused the payments to double every month and they could breathe easier. I never told her I was the one who found him. Scarlett started smiling more, stopped slouching and got a new closet. The change was amazing and guys started hitting on her, especially after she started wearing those tight shorts to games and practices. By then she was getting comfortable with me and I became her shield. The girls used to put us together all the time. I don't know when it happened, but we often held hands while the girls dragged us to their events. They ended up staying overnight a lot, with the girls sharing a room and Scarlett using the guest room. My money allowed me to buy a very nice house. It was situated on 40 acres of hills and lowlands, had a pond, a 10-acre pasture, and a six-stall barn. The previous owners were horse lovers. It wasn't long before the house was filled with horses. I approached the idea with some apprehension. I hadn't had much interaction with horses and their size, as well as their large teeth, frightened me. Scarlet laughed softly at me. She grew up on a farm and always had a horse when she was little. After five months, I gave in and instructed her to find horses for the kids, including her, and one for herself. I would pay all the expenses and she would only have to teach the children how to ride and care for them. I'll pay, but I'll be damned if I'm going to be shoveling shit. There was a lot of grumbling, but Scarlet stood her ground. Either they take care of their animals or we get rid of them. I don't know exactly when we started making decisions about kids together. Scarlet just took the lead and I followed her lead. That Christmas Scarlet bought me a horse, a big pinto with a sly twinkle in his eye. It took a lot of begging and finally Scarlet said that if I didn't start riding with them, she would stop spending time with me. This sent the children into a panic. The girls have reached the age where their bodies are starting to change and they told her all their fears and concerns. My son obviously really missed his mother figure. He had a lot of problems during the divorce and Scarlett seemed to be a calming factor. I learned to ride and eventually started shoveling horse shit. Scarlett had us put the waste in a pile and after it matured, she would use it for compost in her garden. I'm not sure exactly when I agreed to a vegetable garden, but one day we were buying a cultivator and hand tools. She tried to operate the cultivator, but the big machine bounced her around. When I finished laughing, which infuriated her unspeakably, I took over. After the plot was tilled and leveled, she could run it, but if she wanted to expand the plot, which was twice, I was called back into service. The children helped because she told them that if they didn't, they wouldn't be able to eat anything that grew. Then she told them the story of the red hen. They thought it was funny, but they got the point. We had just taken the girls to soccer camp when I asked her if she thought she would ever start dating again. Had she gotten tired of being single? Her face turned red and had a you really don't like what's going on expression on it, but then she started laughing. I'm dating. He's a pretty nice guy, even if he's oblivious to the world around him most of the time. Jealousy shot through me like lightning. She saw it and grinned. I'm dating you, silly. How many times have we gone out to eat, to the movies, or on field trips with the kids? I don't know why I even keep an apartment. We're with you five days a week as it is. But it's just family stuff. You're absolutely right. I'd draw you a picture, but I'm afraid you'd break down trying to figure it out. It's family stuff because we've become a family. Your kids already call me mom when you're not around, and Kelsey plans to take you to school on father-daughter day. It's a good thing she's at a different school now, or there would be a major scheduling conflict. By then, she was already holding my hand. It's a good thing your son went to science camp. I'm in love with you, honey, and have been for a long time. I respect your position because I know your ex has hurt you a lot. But tell me, when was the last time you were with another woman? You can't, can you? Maybe because you have feelings for someone but were afraid to tell her? That's going to change today. It's time to make a decision. If you want me, turn right toward your house. If not, turn left and take me to my apartment. It's your choice. Just at that moment, we pulled up to an intersection. I fiddled with the signal a bit and grinned. Look at this. I think the left turn signal is broken. Then I'd better turn right. 
I'd hate to provoke a collision. Her smile eclipsed the sun. Oh, there will be a collision. A big one. The kids will probably hear everything in their camps. Now hurry up. Let's go home. Just before we turned into our driveway, I grinned. Good thing I bought a house with extra bedrooms. Kelsey needs to pick one of them. Her grip on my arm nearly cut off my circulation. That won't be necessary. The girls have already decided to share a room, at least for a while. I'm sure they'll want their own bedrooms later, but right now they're together. And who knows? We might need an extra bedroom someday. As soon as the garage door closed, we snuggled against each other for a few minutes. When we finally pulled away, she took my face in her hands and looked into my eyes. You don't talk about it, but I know what happened to your first wife. I just want you to know that I'm not really into the club life, but when I'm committed, I'm committed completely. I don't have much, but I have honor, and I swear to you that in future relationships I will never do anything like that. Ever. I promise. Is that enough? I looked into those soulful, loving eyes and smiled. Enough. Later, she offered to sign a prenup, but after my outburst, she only chuckled and never brought it up again. For a while, Linda was having a very hard time. The repercussions of being so public with me and the alienation of affection lawsuit that made headlines for weeks haunted her like a stray dog begging for a handout. She quit her former job, saying her luggage was too heavy to carry every day. Financially, she was in good shape thanks to her piece of the mark pie, so she took her time and didn't work for almost a year. Then she took a job at a small firm just starting out. She did her research and invested a million in a startup, taking a 10% stake in the company. A year later, she was promoted and the company began to expand. I researched them more out of idle curiosity than anything else. And while they had a good product and a good business plan, they were seriously underfunded. I discussed this at length with my investment managers and when they went public, quietly invested 5 million in our children's names and gave Linda proxies to vote. Despite what she did to me, she always looked out for her children's best interests. As a result of the purchase, she became the controlling partner. When it became necessary to split the business, she was promoted to vice president of sales and production. Linda worked 50 hours a week or more, but seemed to thrive. And besides, the children were often at my house, looking at their little brother with delight. Scarlett was six years younger and told me that one of the conditions of the marriage was that at least one child be born. Daniel Brock, that was his grandfather's name, was almost two, and I was even glad the older kids liked him so much because it gave Scarlett a break now and then. The first thing she did was, at my insistence, change careers and become a stay-at-home mom. It was a full-time job with three teenagers and a two-year-old to keep up with. I still don't sleep well, and sometimes in the middle of the night my eyes open, and I think about where I would be now if Linda hadn't cheated. Then I noticed something. If I got up to get a drink or go to the bathroom, Scarlet was restless when I returned, but as soon as I lay down and touched her, she would immediately fall into a deep sleep. Often I woke up to the fact that she was lying almost on top of me. It was as if she wasn't happy and didn't feel safe unless we had physical contact. I also realized that we often held hands when we walked or went shopping, except when one of us had to go get the kids. Then her hand was back in mine. I searched my memory. Linda usually slept as far away from me as possible claiming she was too hot to be comfortable. We were at our son's high school graduation. Scarlett went to take some pictures with his friends. Linda's new husband went with her because his son and ours were great buddies, and that's what initially brought them together, as it did Scarlett and me. They had been married for three years now and seemed happy. She looked at me with sad eyes. Can we talk for a minute? Sure. About what? I need to give you something 12 years late. An apology. It took me about four years and some therapy to really understand what I did to you and the pain you went through. For what it's worth, I'm sorry. Even today, I can't tell you why I did it and thought it would be okay. And this is after years of counseling. For years, I was so angry at you for divorcing me that I couldn't think straight. In my warped view of reality, it wasn't a big deal. I had a chance to sleep with someone famous, and I took it without a second thought. You should have been proud of me. I looked at her and she smiled. I know. Reality didn't come for a long time. Then, after about two years of therapy, my counselor asked me who was on your list of celebrities. Remember, all the people we would sleep with if we were single and had the chance. I immediately thought of Anne Hathaway. Still crushing on her? I grinned. 
Yeah, I like her. I think she's gotten even better looking as she's gotten older. Then my psychologist asked me how I'd feel if we were at a premiere or something and you had the opportunity to sleep with her. You had someone distract me and then you left with her. And then you came home and acted like it was no big deal and wondered why I was so upset. I laughed at first. He would never do anything like that to me, I told her. Then she made me think about it like it really happened and the whole world knows about it. I closed my eyes and replayed the whole thing in my head. I was almost in a rage imagining it. That's when the breakthrough happened. As angry as I was at you in the fantasy, I actually did the exact same thing to you in reality, and nothing could change that. So here's my apology. I was wrong to act the way I did, and you had every reason to divorce me. If you had left with Anne, I would never have trusted you again, no matter how many times you professed your love for me and swore it would never happen again. If I had known then what I know now, I would have laughed in his face when he asked me to dance. I thought about that for a minute. Thank you, Linda. In a way, it makes me feel a little better. I thought about it as I walked away. The water through the dam is not recycled. Burned bridges are very hard to rebuild. You take what life throws at you and do the best you can with what you have. With Linda, I had a lot, but with Scarlett, I have everything. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.